Okay, everybody out there, good evening to all of you. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Well, hope you guys had a resting weekend. I know that those in Texas, some of those in Texas, are relieved to know that the evacuation order has been lifted for certain parts. However, those fires and dry conditions continue. Keep that in mind, please. There is a potential that will be over at least 48% of the USA. At least. That's this year. This year. So you need to stay vigilant. Don't live in high anxiety. Just be vigilant. Be vigilant. Tonight, everybody... I'm going to go over something tonight that is not gone over. Something a lot of people will not touch. I don't blame them. I don't. A lot of people don't talk about this openly. And it causes an opinion to be formed. Right? You guys are going to have opinions afterward. You'll have opinions as soon as I read it. Though we can't deny what we are reading. It'll be blunt. It'll be to the point. It's needful. So I'm asking all of you to give me some latitude. It is not the easiest subject to talk about. In fact, it's one of the most difficult subjects to discuss. It has to do with Revelation 18. But before we ever read Revelation 18, there's something else we have to read from the Bible from the Bible. And again, it will require some latitude, patience, right? I'm sure that some, upon hearing the reading, have to be very careful in commentary, but I'm sure some, upon hearing the reading, may get offended. I'll say it again, it's needful. Needful. The last week, in the book of Revelation, we have been reading about several themes. One theme, one important theme, I kept bringing up on purpose, are the two halves of one. Meaning the fallen side and the redeemed side. Correct? Just like us, we have a sinful side and we have a redeemed side. The sinful side is mentioned as being the old man. The person of us that we used to be. The redeemed side of us is in the hands of the Messiah, the Savior. And he is responsible for saving us. He guides us and grows us spiritually. The fallen side of us, the sinful side, not too many people discuss Many run away from it. Though it is needful in this conversation to cover the fallen side of a specific place to give context to the remaining chapters of Revelation. Without this, without this root, without this foundation of truth, opinions are formed in the absence of of that truth. Opinions form of places and things that may not be related. I will tell you this. If you can bear with me throughout this study, if you can stomach the chapter I'm going to read, you will learn why redemption is so important not only for each and every one of us, but for God's people as a whole. You'll also learn the sentence against the sinful side of us. Most people don't know this, but your sinful side is doomed. It is doomed. Your sinful side is being taken away from you. You are being called out of your sinful side. 
You're being called away from your sinful side. Thus, you have a born-again spirit. A born-again spirit has different desires, different goals. Hmm? Your sinful side knows nothing but rebellion, flesh, and the earth. Nations are the exact same way. The sinful side of nations are the exact same way. And there is no redemption for the sinful side of a nation. So God calls the born-again side of a nation out. Now that term born-again is very important because it not only applies to you, but it also applies to a people or a nation. Remember something, a nation is nothing without its people. People make up the nation. A nation is nothing without its people. So when God redeems a nation, he redeems a people. Which is why you have an identity of being in Christ, grafted into the branch. Right? That's your identity. Prior to that time, prior to that moment, prior to that declaration by the Savior, given by the Most High, your identity was a heathen, somebody in the earth, somebody culpable to flesh, to sin, stomach-turning deeds, and God called you out of it. Not only is a people being redeemed, not only are you being redeemed, but the earth is being redeemed. The earth is nothing without the people and without the nations and without God's creation. How do we know this? God's creation was corrupted in the book of Genesis during the time of the Nephilim, both human beings and animals. Not only did it grieve God that he made man, but it grieved him that the animals also sinned. Imagine that. All flesh was corrupted. And what did our father do? From that corrupted world, before he destroyed it, he secured the redemptive element of that world. He changed it, and he formed a new world from what he redeemed out of it. Remember that process. Because whatever God redeems out of that sinful hole, he makes a brand new place with it. In this case, we're going to be talking about a people or a nation tonight. People and a nation are one in the same. This nation was a sinful nation, but they had redemption from time to time and the elements of redemption were within the people always and from that people from that redemptive side of that nation God will in fact recreate the world that is the promise again remember a nation is nothing without the people nothing without the people people constitute a nation. So as we begin to read, remember the process, there are two halves, the fallen half or the sinful half, and the redeemed half. It's important, if you're going to know the redeemed part of anything and have an appreciation for what the Lord is doing, have an appreciation for revelation itself, most people do not have an appreciation for revelation. They don't. Because they don't understand, they don't yet comprehend that simple process of God's salvation. And again, it began during the time of Noah. God redeemed this earth and the people out of whom he selected to be on the ark. Animals likewise. All of creation was corrupted. All of it was. And all of it was destroyed. And a new world was created. It was reborn. And it fell again. This is the last time. 
the final time, the last process, because now the entirety of the earth is going to be redeemed, but this time it's going to be a fully spiritual manner with full spiritual declarations and all flesh that chooses or that is corrupt will be separated from everything else it will be divided all sin will be pulled away and divided from everything else God will make a permanent separation of the fallen side and the redeemed side and there will no more be sin this is the completion of the process that began a long, long time ago. So again, to have an appreciation for revelation for what the Lord is doing, so that you won't see it as absolute destruction. Understand what the Lord is doing. Also understand right now, is the world in a redeemed state or fallen state? You cannot, there's no in-between. You're either in a redeemed state or a fallen state. What state is the world in right now? fallen state if it were in a redeemed state it would embrace the redeemer it's not there are many nations on this earth are any of these nations in a redeemed state no they're not and so what is our father going to do He's going to redeem the world for final time. There are elements of these nations, one in particular, that we have to learn about tonight. Your eyes and your ears must hear. You must see and hear this to be properly prepared. Because if you're not properly prepared, you will not be able to suffer what comes next. You won't. The Lord's declarations are clear. And men can rename components as much as they want, but the Lord made a declaration. And it will not fail. So it's best for us to understand it according to the word of God. All right. Again, before we read Revelation 18, we're going to read something else. If you guys don't mind, pull out your Bibles. Turn to Ezekiel, chapter 16, if you would. I'm going to take a few, a few breaks in between this. I'm going to be as concise as possible. I'm going to keep the commentary to a minimum. Hopefully you guys can see it for what it is make no assumptions you must hear the whole thing first the context of this carries on to revelation but make no mistake this is God's declaration period so if you don't mind Ezekiel 16 1 let's go again the word of the Lord came unto me saying son of man cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite, and thy mother, thy mother a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, in the day that thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in the water supple to thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee, to do any of these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person the day that thou wast born. That means they were cast away. And when I passed by thee, I saw thee polluted in thine own blood. And I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live, yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. 
This is the father talking about a nation all of you know about. This is the beginning of it. This is the adoption of that nation. The mother. The mother was a Hittite. The father was an Amorite. Let's continue. I've caused thee to multiply as the bud of the field. Thou hast increased and waxen great. Thou art come excellent ornaments. Thy breasts are fashioned, and thine hair is grown. Whereas thou was naked and bare. Now do me a favor. Ezekiel 16.2. I want you guys to highlight abominations. To cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. That's very important. Also, I want you to highlight Ezekiel 16.7. Thou was naked and bare. Highlight that. Let's continue. Ezekiel 16, 8. Now when I passed by thee, I looked upon thee, and behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over thee, and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, and entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord God. And thou becamest mine. Let me stop. Which means, God adopted Jerusalem under the earth. God passed by, passed by, and fully embraced human beings to be the beginning of a nation, fully adopting them. He washed them. He made them his people. And what type of people were they before they were washed? Hmm? It says, thy birth and thy nativity in the land of Canaan, thy father was an Amorite and thy mother was a Hittite. Do you know that Amorites? Worshipped all sorts of gods. Do you know that Hittites did the same? So they were not God-fearing people of the Lord our God, but heathens. And God adopted them. He adopted them. They were naked and bare, Ezekiel 7, 16, 7. God spread a skirt over them and covered their nakedness. And then he swore unto them and he entered into a covenant with them and it says Ezekiel 16 8 scripture fragment at the end and thou becamest mine so in that day they became the lords now you know the origin of that nation now you know it let's continue Ezekiel 16 9 then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away the blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. Blood is sin. Any infraction, any indecency, any dark thing was washed away from them. Their practices of worship and everything else, gone. Gone, because God washed it away. They didn't change it. The Lord God did. As he did the prophets. Let's continue. I clothed thee with broidered work and shod with baggers skin. And I girded thee about with fine linen. And I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments. Ezekiel 16, 11 highlight that. I decked thee also with ornaments. And I put bracelets upon thy hands and a chain on thy neck. And I put a jewel on thy forehead. Please highlight that. He put a jewel on their forehead. On their forehead. And earrings in thine ears. And a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver. Highlight Ezekiel 16, 13. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver. Stay up with me. And thy raiment was of fine linen and silk embroidered work, and thou, thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil. Thou was exceeding beautiful. Thou didst prosper into a kingdom. So they formed into a kingdom with many blessings. Many blessings. Hmm? Many blessings. Now remember, wait a minute, let me pause. Now remember at the beginning of the conversation, 
if you don't hear the whole thing, you're going to enter into assumptive reasoning. And we don't want to do that. We want to hear the whole thing so that we can have it in context. We will discuss that a little bit before we go to Revelation. It's important to know the fallen side of what we're talking about here. It's important, very important. Ezekiel 16, 14. And thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty, for it was perfect through thy comeliness. Ezekiel 16, 14. Highlight the word. Perfect through my comeliness. Which I had put upon thee, saith the Lord. Ezekiel 16, 15. But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and playest the harlot because of thy renown, and poured out thy fornications on every one that passed by. His it was. <sighs> and of thy garments thou didst take, and deckest thy high places with diverse colors, different colors, and playedest the harlot thereupon. The like things shall not come, neither shall it be so. That means... Your previous days are not coming back. You won't be able to do this again. Let's continue. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given thee, and madest of thyself images of men, and didst commit whoredoms with them, and tookest thy broidered garments and coverest them, and thou hast sent mine oil and mine incense before them. That's worship. Worship of what? Men. They made statues of men, idols. My meat also which I gave thee, fine flour and oil and honey, wherewith I fed thee. Thou hast even set it before them for a sweet savor. And thus it was, saith the Lord God. The fine flour, oil, and honey. These things, these things are also food of the soul, especially when it mentions honey. Honey is very fulfilling. In fact, if you're ever hungry, right? If you weren't, if everybody's taste buds were not so mushed up by all this processed stuff, honey would be quite amazing to taste. Quite amazing. And it was called by many heathens the food of the gods for a reason. Because it is, he gives you a euphoric feeling upon eating it. So the Lord is, what he's saying here, he had put in them the best. He put in them the best. It's kind of like you reading the word of God and you're filled up with the spirit. And all of a sudden you go next door to your buddy drinking and you start talking about the word of God. And he's still drinking, rebutting everything that you say and then adding interjections of fantasy into it. You start agreeing with it. That's called fornication. That's when you take something precious and you begin to mingle it with forbidden things. And by the end of the conversation, what you once had that was pure is now distorted. Your mind is full of questions. You can no longer receive the word of God, but you have a thousand questions regarding everything of the word of God because your knowledge is tainted. Let's continue. 1620. Moreover, thou hast taken thy sons and thy daughters, whom thou hast borne unto me. These, it says, and these haste thou sacrificed unto them to be devoured. Is this of thy whoredoms a small matter? They burnt their children in fires. Burned them up is what they did. Burned them up is what they did. That thou, is it a small matter that thou hast slain my children and delivered them to cause them to pass through the fire for them? Do you hear these terms? Do they sound familiar? I know they're offensive. I know nobody wants to hear that. But this is the fallen state of a place. The historical truth of a place. 
and in all thine abominations and all thy whoredoms, thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth. When thou wast naked and bare, and wast polluted in thy blood, and it came to pass after all thy wickedness, woe, woe, woe unto thee, saith the Lord God, that thou hast also built up unto thee an eminent place, and hast made thee in high place in every street. Highlight that, a high place in every street. Thou hast built thy high place at every head of the way, and hast made the beauty to be abhorred or hated, and has opened thy feet to every one that passed by, and multiplied thy whoredoms. Thou hast also committed fornication with the Egyptians, thy neighbors, great of flesh, and hast increased thy whoredoms and provoked me to anger. Highlight Ezekiel sixteen twenty six. They provoked God to anger. Why? Because they belonged to him. Because he fully adopted them. And they fully turned away. Behold, therefore, I have stretched out my hand over thee, and have diminished thine ordinary food, and delivered thee unto the will of them that hate thee, the daughters of the Philistines, which are ashamed of thy lewd way. Thou hast played the whore also with the Assyrians, because thou wast unsatiable. That means... We can be satisfied. Yea, thou hast played the harlot with them, and yet couldst not be satisfied. Thou hast moreover multiplied thy fornication in the land of Canaan unto the Chaldean. And yet thou washed, thou wast not satisfied herewith. Even after all of what they did, they, still, they, they were hungrier for more dirt, for more sin. How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord God, seeing thou dost all these things, the work of an imperious horse woman, and that thou buildest thine eminent place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and hast not been as an harlot, and that thou scornest higher. But as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of a husband, thy gifts to all whores. Listen, thy gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gift to all thy lovers, and hirest them, that they may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. And the contrary is in thee, from other women in thy whoredoms, whereas none followeth thee to commit whoredoms, and in that thou givest a reward, and no reward is given unto thee. Therefore thou art contrary. Hear that word contrary? Thou art contrary. God doesn't like this word. Not not with this description. I heard someone defend that one time. Oh, God likes contrary things. It's important to have context to everything. A lot of people use things out of context. Playing with a holy word. Now, as we're reading, you can see that Jerusalem was adopted by the living God of everybody on the earth. She was adopted by the living God. She was washed. She had the promise of the living God. Nobody else. And she committed whoredoms with everybody. And in here it says they did not commit anything with her that she did not initiate. She was above them all. Uh-oh. She was above them all. This is her fallen state. This is the true fallen state. The true fallen condition of Jerusalem. Let's continue to read. Wherefore, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God. Because thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers. Please highlight that, Ezekiel 16, 36, scripture fragment right there in the middle. Thy filthiness was poured out and thy nakedness discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers. That's very important. It was discovered through thy whoredoms with thy lovers. And with all the idols... Of, thine, uh, of thy abominations, and by the blood of thy children which thou did give unto them. 
Behold, therefore, I will gather all thy lovers with whom thou hast taken pleasure, and all them that hast loved, with all them that hast hated. I will even gather them round about against thee, and I will discover thy nakedness unto them, and they may see all thy nakedness. Ezekiel 16.37, scripture fragment at the very end. And they, it says, and will discover thy nakedness unto them. That's what needs to be highlighted. You see that? And will discover thy nakedness unto them, and they may see all thy nakedness. That's very important. Very important. Ezekiel 16.38, and I will judge thee as a woman that breaks break wedlock and shed blood are judged and i will give thee the blood and the fury and jealousy i will also give thee into, into their hand and they shall throw down thine eminent place and shall break down thy high places they shall strip thee also of thy clothes and shall take thy fair jewels and leave thee naked and bare they shall also bring up a company against thee, and they shall stone thee with stones, and thrust thee through with swords. And they shall burn thine houses with fire, and execute judgments upon thee in the sight of many women. And I will cause thee to cease from playing the harlot, and thou shalt also give no hire any more. Now, they're going to make her naked. They're going to make her naked. They're going to burn her. They're going to consume her. Make her naked, burn and consume her. So will I make my fury toward thee rest. After he has done all these things, these judgments, which are decreed unto her. Ezekiel sixteen forty two. So will I make my fury towards thee to rest in my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet. I will be no more angry. This is after this happens. After everybody is bought down against her. After everybody can see her nakedness, can see right through her to see what she truly is. I'm telling you something is stirring up even right now. And it will be uncovered, but not to the liking of those who believe in Christ. Because this is just not being read. It's not being told. The decree in most readings is as though it does not exist. There's a standing decree against Jerusalem even right now. And Jesus said something to them which nailed it right in the ground and he told them. Jesus told them. He already told them. But who is listening? Let me continue. His fury is going to rest and his jealousy shall depart from them. And he'll be quiet, be angry no more. Ezekiel 16, 43. Because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, but hast fretted me in all these things. Behold, therefore, I also will recompense thy way upon thy head, saith the Lord. And thou shalt not commit this lewdness above all thine abominations. Behold, everyone that useth proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, As is the mother, so is the daughter. Highlight Ezekiel 16, 44, scripture fragment at the very end. As is the mother, so is the daughter. Please highlight that. Thou art my mother's daughter that loneth her husband and her children. Thou art the sister of thy sister, which loathed her husband and their children. Loathed means hated. Her husband and her children. Your mother was an Hittite and your father an Amorite. And thine elder sister is Samaria. She and her daughters that dwell at thy left hand and thy young sister that dwelleth at thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Oh my. Yet, yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations, but as if 
that were a very little thing, thou was corrupted more than they in all thy ways. They were worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Did you hear that? Did you guys hear that? They were worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Worse. Highlight that. That's Ezekiel 1645, Ezekiel 1646. Let's continue. And Ezekiel 1647. Okay. Let's continue. As I live, saith the Lord, Sodom thy sister had not done. She nor her daughters, as thou hast done. Thou and thy daughters. Do you hear that? So it says, he says, as I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom, and your sisters have not done. She nor her daughters, as you have done, you and your daughters. So I want you to get this, that, that Jerusalem has daughters. She has daughters. And God is saying, even Sodom and her daughters and those that are like Sodom didn't do what you did, you and your daughters. Behold, this way of iniquity of thy sister Sodom pride, fullness of bread and abundance of idols was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Let me stop. Because this way, this way in Ezekiel 1649, let me read this one more time. This is totally up to you to see the characteristics. This spiritual characteristic of Sodom. Why? Because there's a curse upon Sodom during the end days. Yet Sodom does not exist. But there's a curse upon Sodom. So let me read it one more time. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. So what was the iniquity? Pride. Thinking herself above everybody else. Uh-oh. Fullness of bread. She had everything. Uh-oh. An abundance of idleness was in her. She just sat around and did nothing for anybody around about her or herself. Collectors, rich, fat, all these different things. It was in her and in her daughters. It says, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor needy. Let me tell you something. Sustaining the poor needy, sustaining them in a poor needy state is not strengthening them. To strengthen the poor needy is to pick them up and to teach them and to cultivate them. Not force them like prisoners, but to teach and cultivate them. Do you hear me? Once you teach and cultivate the poor needy, you don't have the poor needy anymore. If you attempt to sustain the poor needy only, you're going to keep the poor needy in that land, and they're going to be indeed poor needy. And that is criminal. That is shameful. That's an abomination. And that's what men do. That's what these kingdoms do. Let me continue. And they were haughty and committed abomination before men. Therefore I took them away, as I saw good. Neither had Samaria committed half thy sins. But thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they. And hast justified thy sisters and all thine abominations, which thou hast done. Thou also which hast judged thy sister, bear thine own shame for the sins that thou hast committed more abominable than they. So not only are they themselves an abomination in this case, but they looked at everybody else, right? And tried to say that they were had abominations when they had worse abominations. They are more righteous than thou. Yea, but thou confound it also, and bear thy shame, in that thou hast justified thy sister, as these kingdoms do. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then will I bring again the captivity of thy captives in the midst of them, that thou mayest bear thine own shame, and mayest be confounded in all that thou hast done and that thou art a comfort unto them. Why would God ever say that? Listen, in that thou art comfort unto them, when thy sisters Sodom and her daughters shall return to the former estate, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate, then thou and thy daughters shall return to your former estate. Uh-oh, we're there. 
to return to your former estates, to return to your former place. For thy sister Sodom was not mentioned by my mouth in the day of thy pride, before thy wickedness was discovered, as at that time of thy reproach of thy daughters of Syria, and all that are around about her, the daughters of the Philistines, which despise thee round about. Thou hast borne thine lewdness and thine abomination, saith the Lord. Now listen, this is important. For thus saith the Lord God, I even deal with thee as thou hast done, which hast despised the oath in the breaking, the covenant. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with thee in the days of thy youth, and I will establish unto thee an everlasting covenant. Then thou shalt remember thy ways and be ashamed. Now we know that hasn't happened yet. Then thou shalt remember thy ways and be ashamed when thou hast received thy sister, thine elder, and thy younger. And I will give unto them, I will give unto thee for daughters, but not by thy covenant. And I will establish my covenant with thee, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, that thou mayest remember and be confounded, and never open, never open thy mouth any more because of thy shame. When I pass by toward thee for all that thou hast done, saith the Lord God. In other words, when God corrects them, it won't even be in their hearts to do what they did. Because in fact they're doing the exact same thing now. They're calling out to everybody on every side when all they had to do was call out on the living God. The Lord said he would restore them to their former estates. The Lord said he would restore them, Samaria and some other places, to their former state. That is the establishment of the Middle East right before they do what they have to do. And then God would bring all of this to fruition. All of it. Not some of it. All of it to fruition. But as you can see, Jerusalem had a fallen state. Also, you can tell that the Lord was talking about these end times. Because he said they would never forget. And he will not rest. He'll not rest until this is done. Now, we all know when the Lord does rest, he's going to let us know. He is resting. See, when the Lord rests, there is no evil. When there's evil, the Lord does not rest. Keep that in mind. When the world is sinful, there is no rest. Keep that in mind. That's why the only place of rest one can enter is Christ for us on an individual basis. In this case, with the living God, he will only rest following the correction of his people. But you heard the descriptions. Chief harlot of all. And everybody else is subordinate to her being a harlot. Every other harlot on the earth is subordinate to this one. To Jerusalem. But why is it so, so bad? Because if you all studied the book of Jeremiah, you'd learn something. That if Israel right now, right now, turned back to the living God, acknowledged her ways, these ways, quit compensating herself, saying that we need Russia, we need the USA, we need this place, and call out on the living God, I mean truly turn to her. God said he would heal the entire earth, and his name will be known throughout the entire earth. Now, when God says his name will be known throughout the entire earth, do you not know that's a very special Hebrew phrase that was used there? That to know his name, we don't know his name. We do not know his name. Nobody can use his name because they don't know it. We can use the name of Jesus, but we cannot use the name of God because we do not know it. God is not his name. God is a title. And these kingdoms are in a fallen state. And this will be brought to fruition. Now you know the state, the condition. Now you know why Revelation is the way it is. Now you know who is who. Well, let me give you a caution. Try not to convince anybody of 
love who is who. Hold that close to your hearts. We live in the times where everything will be uncovered. And when they see it, they will be confused. Those who love the word of God, they will be confused. They will be confused. But you'll have the truth. And you won't be confused. When you have knowledge that you have kept for the sake of the Lord's word and his timing, the Lord will add to you knowledge and wisdom when it's time to talk to the people during the time of disclosure, God's disclosure, when nobody can deny he is at work. When I come back from this break, I'm going to answer a few questions. I'm going to recap something in Revelation so that you'll see it. And then we'll go forward. All right. I'll be right back in a few minutes right here at COT. I'm back again. Okay. Now, um, believe it or not, that's a very difficult chapter to go through. Especially when people have not, not used to hearing that not used to hearing those descriptions. Not used to that. As you can see, and there is a whole lot more. In fact, Ezekiel 16 is restated time and time again throughout the Word of God. Do you guys know that? It is the condition of a fallen nation. The core of what God adopted. In the Bible it says, Jerusalem alone will be trampled underfoot 40 in two months. It does not name any other place. Jerusalem is key. In Ezekiel 16, God declared they would discover her nakedness. They would consume her flesh. They'd burn her. But that's the fallen state of Jerusalem. It will be punished. God will never cancel his covenant. But on the contrary, he said, although they despised his covenant, He's going to remember his covenant with them. In the days of their youth, in the beginning, he will remember it. That correction will come as part of his covenant. To keep her, listen to me, to keep Jerusalem, he must correct it. Correction of the two halves is to get rid of the sinful half, to totally separate it from the redeemed half. This process that you see in Ezekiel 16, these declarations you see in Ezekiel 16 are important for the entire earth. Though it happens in one place, that one place governs the entire earth. The one place. God's indignation comes for one reason. And this is something also that will be clarified. Notice, God did not, he wasn't speaking about his wrath, was he? In the New Testament, it says God's wrath is against what? The children of disobedience. Correct? That's who his wrath is against, the children of disobedience. God's wrath is. The children of disobedience will endure God's wrath. God's correction, his indignation, right? Which in Jeremiah was declared to be at the end days, not the beginning, not the middle, but at the end days, his indignation is when he will do what he does and he'll not be satisfied until that is complete. And when you're reading Revelation, you find something. Right after the trampling of Jerusalem underfoot, everything changes. Everything changes. 
Did you know that? Everything does. It's almost like once that happens, and Jerusalem is truly, truly secured, the rest of the world is kaput. They are kaput. In the Bible, you read that Jerusalem will become a cup of trembling, but not that. That's after. That's after Jerusalem is overrun. Then they become a cup of trembling. When, when God looks down upon the land, he remembers that land, pities the people, and his declarations come forth against the heathen, against those who would set their hearts against his holy place. Now, isn't it funny that everybody in the world knows God's covenant? Don't you find that funny? How is it that everybody knows God's covenant without saying God's covenant? How is it that everybody knows Israel is Israel? How is it that everybody affiliates Israel with the living God, with Christianity? How is it they understand it's the home of it? How is it that Jerusalem is contested of all the Middle East? It's always in high-level talks. Why would they continually mention Jerusalem in high-level talks all around the world? Hmm. Why has Jerusalem been ravaged by war over and over again? Do you know how many times Israel fell? Do you know how many times Jerusalem fell? More than any nation on the face of the earth. Do you know that? No nation has been done as it's been done to Israel. No nation has undergone that. No nation has survived multiple exiles. No nation. Only to be bought back again. No nation has survived those things. But there's some fallen side of it. And that fallen side must be purged. So what did God say he would do? He would have Jerusalem discovered. Her nakedness would be discovered. Her flesh would be consumed. It would be utterly torn down. Utterly taken over. That's what most people are not taught. That's what they don't understand. So when they read scriptures like Jerusalem in Revelation where it says Jerusalem must be trampled underfoot 40 and two months. When they read that in the book of Daniel where it says he will have the power of the arm and they will go into Jerusalem and set up the abomination that make it desolate there. And he'll set up these idols all throughout the lands and everything and somebody takes over Jerusalem. When it says that God will draw all the armies down to Jerusalem to surround her, we just he just spoke about that here, didn't he? He made that declaration. He said, I'm going to call all your enemies and all your lovers and everybody that was with you down there to see you. That's what he said. Now you know why he draws everybody down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Yes, he will plead with him there, but he does so for a reason. He's going to draw everybody down there. Because the truth of his trial will be uncovered. Listen, in our, when we're redeemed, us, do you not know? Part of the process of your redemption, when it comes to completion, is when you're no longer ashamed of what God saved you from. As you grow in the Lord, at first, you're ashamed of what God saved you from. You are. You're ashamed. All of us were ashamed. As time goes forward, you're no longer ashamed of what God saved you from. When you're no longer ashamed of what God saved you from, you're visible. People don't look at you like some saint walking on the earth as though you never sinned. People see a sinner saved by grace. Amen to that one. They don't see some person walking who is perfect in all other ways, no. They see a sinner saved by grace. They see the work of the living God. Hmm? That's what they see. Not the phony baloney side where somehow people think that somebody on earth 
is walking perfectly and as their doo-doo does not stink. That, that's not the case. I hate to be direct, but that gets the point across because all poop stinks and men have poop. So you get the picture? So men can have the appearance of walking as though they don't smell, but they do smell. And their only salvation is within Christ. So I'll say it again. When we are no longer ashamed of our sin, people will see a sinner saved by grace. That, ladies and gentlemen, will minister to those who see you. Hmm? Not to perpetuate a falsehood. As though someone never sinned. We know that's not the truth. And when we are no longer ashamed of our own sin, we end up utilizing it to communicate to other people, to let them know we've been there too. But there's a Savior. But the way has been made for us to be fully redeemed. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. To tell someone, hey, I know what you're doing. I did that too, but you can be forgiven. There was a way meant for humanity that was established by Christ that we lost a long time ago. And you don't have to continue living in that darkness. See, when you're no longer ashamed of your sin, you begin to minister by simply living. But you're living in the truth. Imagine what will happen when God has Jerusalem discovered. See, unlike your sin, listen to me, unlike you, God did not go out and advertise your sin to the world. He didn't do that. He did not do that for you on an individual basis. He didn't do it to me on an individual basis. He did not do that. He gently brought us to salvation. But for Jerusalem, Jerusalem is unlike anybody else. God has made his decree to have her fully uncovered. God will fully expose the iniquitous part of her. Now listen to me. When he does this, that's going to cause a shock to everybody else. And when they see it, that's when they're going to scoff big time. That's when they're going to laugh big time. That's when they're going to do evil things you never thought anybody was capable of doing. And then God will intervene. And in that day, in that day, when God intervenes, when she is uncovered, when she's half dead, wounded and burnt, they'll see the loving nature and the raw power of the living God. As they see the process of salvation upon that place, and then everyone, who set their hearts against Jerusalem during her time of redemption will flee. And only those whom the Lord allows to get free will witness what happened. But everybody else is going to be kaput. That's why Jerusalem becomes a cup of trembling. Because in that day, People are going to learn that God, yes, he is forgiving. Yes, he is real. And yes, he loves his people. Beyond the nature of all love, he loves his people. Can you imagine seeing a place that proclaims to be the Holy Land being brutalized by every force in the world and every force in the world is prosperous against the destruction of the place that said they were the Holy Land? Can you imagine three and a half years goes by 
and invaders have that land, scoffing at the people, totally desecrating the plants. But then right when it ends, the God of gods, the creator of all things, intervenes himself. When men witness the unimaginable, what will go through their minds? I'll tell you, they're going to be frightened. They're going to be scared to death, and they're going to know that the Lord loves who he said he loves. Did you ever notice that there was no major thing of the living God truly seen on the earth until Jerusalem is trampled underfoot? Right after that, the Lord steps in. Then you notice. Okay. We have a bunch more to discuss on that one. So keep Ezekiel 16 in mind. Keep it in mind. Now, I'm going to go back to Revelation 17 real quick. Listen, and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now this is important, she sits upon many waters. I know who people think this is, but listen to me. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Do you know that direct, that statement? It's very direct in another chapter in the Bible. And it was caused by one place. My, my. Now listen to this. It says, here it is. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy. Having seven heads and ten horns, she's sitting atop this beast. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having the golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. Mystery Babylon the Great. The great mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, she sits atop the many waters. The many waters is the beast. So she is not part of the beast. Uh-oh. She's not part of the beast. She is not the beast. She's not part of the beast. She sits atop the beast. We just read how God's land, his own people, fornicated on every single entry, every roadway. They sat and they sat and waited to fornicate with everybody who passed by, to intermingle, to do everything, to make deals with, to prosper with everybody round about them. Giving away, she was given gold and silver. She was decked with gold and silver. She gave it away, didn't she? To everybody round about her with God's precious things she had. She's the mother of harlots, the first one. The mother of harlots, the first one. She herself is not Babylon. She is mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. She herself is not Babylon. She is mystery Babylon. And if it's a mystery, but it's not well understood and it's also hidden, so it's not obvious. It is not the place anybody would ever freely call Babylon. Uh-oh. So it's not something you can look at, Christians, and say, oh yeah, that's Babylon. Nope. It says Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. Who put a jewel in the head of Jerusalem? Who did that? When God put Jerusalem together, who put a jewel in her forehead? Who decked her? with precious stones and precious things. Who decked her with gold and with silver and fine linen and all that good stuff? The living God did. And what did she do? What did she do? She committed whoredoms. Grievous whoredoms. She was worse than Solomon. 
She was worse. Worse than Samaria. Worse than everybody else. Worse. This woman sits at the top of the beast. Now let me read this. You ready? And the ten horns was all sauce. There are ten kings which have received no kingdom as of yet but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for, the, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. You hear that? I'll say it again. And the waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. The beast does not like her. Now, a lot of people say, well, that has to be the Vatican. Here's the problem. The world loves the Vatican. The world loves the Vatican. There is one place that these nations of this earth do not like. There is only one place that provokes every nation, even the Vatican. There's only one place on earth that's like that. There's only one place hated of all nations. There's only one place. Only one place. And see, what I'm trying to tell you is this. Prior to the redemption of the living God, all you're going to see is the fallen state, the sinful shadow of what Israel is. You don't see the redeemed Israel. You don't. Because if it were the redeemed Israel, it would not need any nation. There would be no sin coming from Israel. And no one would dare attack it. That's not what you're seeing. You're seeing a fallen condition of Israel. You're seeing it prior. Prior to the everlasting kingdom that's going to be put there. That's God's land. And the new Jerusalem, which will descend out of heaven to the earth, will be there. But it's not there yet. And Jerusalem, Jerusalem is not measured not measured means not accounted for because it's given to the heathen, to the various animalistic people of the earth. That means it's in a fallen state. The woman is in a fallen state and she's hated. The beast hates her. And they're going to attack her. They're going to burn her with fire, eat her flesh, that is, to devour her, to overtake her. There's only one place with that declaration, only one place that has that declaration. That is to say, Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot forty and two months because the Lord will redeem her. She will be redeemed. God has an everlasting covenant with that place. She will be redeemed. But right now, what you're seeing is the fallen state of Israel. And you know what? The world does not know that. They don't know that. They don't know it. They don't know it. But they're going to find out. God didn't make a declaration to any place on earth except for Israel. And he said he would draw all nations are going to be against Jerusalem. He didn't say all nations are going to be against Baghdad. All nations are going to be against Babylon. All nations are going to be against Sodom. No, that's not what he said. All nations are going to be against Jerusalem. And if they're all against her, well, now you know what the beast truly is. Now you know why all nations of the earth, all their armies are going to be destroyed. Uh, totally destroyed. All the armies of the earth. Now you know. Hmm. All right. 
Let me answer a couple of questions, everybody. Just a couple. Let me answer a couple. So we can go on to the new, uh, the, this other uh, set of passages here. Anybody have any, everyone thinks three and a half years, but what if it's different? It doesn't matter. You know what, in my book, it doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you something. When Jerusalem is taken, nobody's going to be counting their calendar. They're not. Because when they're taken, the earth is under siege by a brand new spirit. The powers of this earth will have been changed. Hmm? Somebody says, my question, Luke 13, Jesus said, why callest me good? There is only one good, my Father in heaven. Why is he saying he was not good but just the Father? Because the word cannot be good of itself. Let me ask you something. Is your word good? If you wrote me something and I have your word, what good can that word do me? Nothing. You're the author of that word. You're the only one that can be good. So Jesus, being the word of God made flesh and dwelt among men, is pointing the goodness back to the Most High. He's telling them the truth. He's telling them that the word cannot be good. The word is just the word. The originator of that word is good. That's what he's telling them. Can you see that? See, a lot of people do not know that Jesus is the word of God made flesh. It will be just like everything you speak being made a person. That person, if it were made a person, that person could only say what you desire it to say. So whatever you think to say, it would say. And if you don't think to say it, it won't say it. See? That's why Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That's why you cannot separate them. You see that? That's why Jesus said, no man hath seen God at any time. And he said, God is spirit. Therefore, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. See how that works? Jesus is the word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. And it was by the word everything was made. By the word everything was made. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? By the word everything was made. And that brings up something else. So what is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the spirit of the living God. The spirit of him. What is the spirit of you? Is the spirit of you the word of you? No. But your word is a result of your spirit. Isn't it? Yes, it is. God is the originator. The Spirit is God's Spirit, which was poured out on all flesh. Acts chapter 2. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh and dwelt among men. Gospel of John, chapter 1 and 2. See how that works? They're all one. He names those components. All right, if a person wants to say the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they say well. If a person wants to say all or one, they say well. They're not saying anything different. Without God, the Spirit does not exist, nor does the Word exist. The Word and the Spirit are the living God. Just like you are your Word. And the motivation behind what you do, Spirit, is the reason your Word came forward. That's why the Bible says, what about the Spirit? Huh? What about the Spirit? It'll give you what to say in the hour you need to say something. Originator. My goodness. But make no mistake. The Holy Spirit is God's Spirit. It is God's active Spirit. And when God's active Spirit is flowing... There's no error. There's no mistake. None. It is perfect in what it gives. It is not some human spirit. It is perfect and without flaw. It is power. And it can issue declarations that cannot be undone. And if we choose to be a vessel of that, then we choose to be a vessel of that. The Holy Spirit is with all of us helping us. But not everybody operates by the power of the Holy Spirit. Matters directed by the living God through Christ Jesus for those who obey him. 
to work by the power of the Holy Spirit is meant for those who obey him, not for those who won't obey him. To obey someone is to carry out what they tell you, not to question everything they give you. That takes a massive amount of trust, which means you have to be rooted in faith without proof. That means you don't have confirmation. You either believe or you don't. That's what that means. Some people want to believe because they have confirmation. I'll tell you this. Do you believe in the one that gave us the words in this book? Or do you see this book as a bunch of writings that people put down and therefore you have questions about everything that's in it? I'll tell you right now, I don't have questions. I don't, if the Lord instructs me by this word, I'm going to go and do it. I don't need to ask anything because I learned something. I chose to do the first time. I did. And I found out something. As you obey, the Lord will explain. See, the Lord will say, come and go here. You don't ask anything. You just keep trucking, right? And as you go, the Lord will say, I sent you here because of so and so and because of this. And he will add knowledge to you. Most people cannot be sent. You know why? The Lord will say, go, and they'll say, why? Then they'll say, well, is this from the Lord? They'll start questioning everything, and they don't move anywhere. When you trust the Lord, and you say, well, Lord, my life is in your hands. I'm going to trust you all the way in all faith. I have no questions. And the Lord sends you somewhere. If you read something in his word that says, love your enemies as yourself, then you just do it. You don't ask why. You just do it because you know he will add to you the wisdom and the knowledge necessary. Hmm? That's, that's our father, his way. That's faith. And no one can make somebody believe. And God is not giving us proof. But he did give you a measure of faith. Which is he did give you. He did give you the ability to believe in the first place. He did that. Nobody else. He did that. And it says in the Bible. If your faith was the size of a mustard seed. You would be unstoppable. Do you know that? So which means what? He gave us a good measure. The problem is we don't believe it all. Let's go ahead and be, be direct in that. We don't believe it all. We don't believe it because we're used to a lifestyle where things have to be proven or you get burnt. Correct? If in the world, if it's not proven to you, you're likely to get burnt. It's very difficult to have faith in things in the world because you get burnt. Why? Because men are behind it. People are behind it. That's why you put your full faith in the Father. So that you can work with everybody, no matter if they burn you or not. Your faith is in the Lord, not in men. Let them compliment the good if they do good. If they're not doing good, they can't compliment the good in you. No problem, no harm. Let each one go their own way. They must make their own choice. If they align with you for a while, then so be it. Thank God for the alignment. If they walk away and fall off a cliff, then so be it. But have your faith and have your trust in the Most High. In Him you are to trust. Only in Him are you to trust. And when you trust in the Lord only, guess what? You can truly love your enemy because you're not expecting anything from them. When you trust someone, it always comes with expectations, demands, always. You'll always look at the other person and say, well, you're supposed to know this. and you're No, take that. Throw that. That's garbage. That's garbage. Absolute garbage. That will give you an excuse to hate someone. I'll say it again. And you're walking this world, should somebody obey just like you do, then they can align with you. Thank God for that. But if they ever decide to walk off a cliff, they have that choice too. And you keep walking with the Lord. So put your trust in the Lord. And others can compliment the good in you. The 
The word says, cease ye from man whose breath is in the loins. Stop chasing men, people. To be your savior in this world as people are doing right now. Okay, where are we at? What do we have? Somebody had another uh, question before we uh, truck forward here. What time is it? We're still going to go in time, right? Yeah, we're going to go in time. All right, folks, folks, we're going to go into Revelation now. Not 17, not Revelation 17. No, 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 no. no. We're going to Revelation 18. Somebody says, do you think Israel will sacrifice a red heifer on March 29th? That's up to them. It's totally up to them. I'll never proceed. I won't proceed what they're ever going to do, if that makes any sense. I can't do that. Somebody says, Mike, you said to avoid the Colburn, please give a credible source for us to find historical information about the destroyer of the binary system. You're not going to find a credible source to your liking concerning that. They spent countless years hiding things like that, right? Countless. Here's what you do, though. Listen to me close. There are things that people can know about, but you trust the word of the Lord. The binary is not what you should fear. It isn't. And the Coburn Bible is only going to give you the accounts of the days of old. The accounts of the days of old are not what we're about to go into. Jesus said the time that we are in right now, the time that we're going into right now is, cannot be compared to anything. He said it's going to be the worst time there ever was since the earth was created. So you can't relate that to anything else. A binary system is only one of a multitude of issues. The greater issue is darkness. Darkness. Remember that. And no one don't trust the Colburn because it's from those philosophers in Egypt. That's why. And I'll tell you something. When you read something from philosophers of other lands, God has already warned people about that. Jesus specifically did. Because that stuff will get into your heart and make you question Christianity. It'll make you go against your own nature. It will. That's exactly how people fall. I don't need to know the details about a great many things. You know why? Because I know the one who knows all things. And at the time I need it, I'm not going to fail to have it. Make sure that your relationship with Christ is solid. And I'm telling you right now, in the time you need to know something, you'll never be lacking. Not ever. Not ever. Knowing the details of things before it ever comes is not going to help anybody, not one iota. Being able to hear the guidance of Christ is life itself. You can know everything, but if you can't be guided, none of your knowledge is going to help you. None of it. In the Bible it says that there are a lot of people forever learning and never coming to the knowledge of the truth. They face destruction that way. Right? Wisdom being the ability to apply knowledge. Wisdom. Well, that's from above. Hmm? That's from above. Make sure your relationship with Christ is right on the money. He will guide you to know things for the sake of the calling in your life. Now, if your calling is to combat certain things in the earth, then naturally he's going to guide you to things you really don't want to see. So you've got to be ready for that. Wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. Some of you, some of you are meant to, you know, there's a time coming where this, this world's going to need a lot of, of deliverance ministers. I mean, some real ones, not the ones with rituals. No, no, talking about folks with the true Holy Ghost. Who can stand before and combat the worst looking things you ever saw in your life? Who can take the words and the, 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 the negative sayings of people? 
to be for somebody to come up to you and throw up in your face and you can still continue with the word of God without interruption that's what's going to be needed vile creatures will come forth and the vile creatures are going to operate spiritually inside of human beings causing human beings to contort and to be vile stinky in the worst way then you're going to have people totally blind to spiritual things they're going to truly think the person is doing it on purpose. It's going to rip entire families to pieces, entire communities to pieces, entire cities to pieces. This is what's coming forward. And it's not slowing down and speeding up. If God is going to shorten the days, and expect everything to be condensed at the end, which means back-to-back -back troubles. Hmm. All right. Revelation 18, here we go. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become a habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Highlight that. Revelation 18, 12. A cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now, you may not like it, but that tells you, I mean, that tells you just bluntly exactly what God is speaking of. Oh, boy. You, you don't want the answer. You don't want the answer. It'd be nice if it was always the other place. But let me ask you this. If a child was born in the middle of the kingdom of the beast, how would the Lord deliver that child? If the child was born in the kingdom of the beast, how would God deliver that child? How would you have somebody to choose Christ if they were born in the kingdom of, a, of the beast and the Antichrist. How would you do that? Anybody? How would you do that? Wouldn't you have to get the child to see where they are? And that would be almost impossible. To you, it would be obvious. Do you know why? You have something to compare it to. If you're born within a nation, you have nothing to compare that nation to. That nation is something evil. You're going to see it at home. You're going to be patriotic. You're going to fight for it with everything you have. And if anybody from the outside were to show, tell a person on the inside, hey, you are part of... Your, this kingdom you're in is, is the beast kingdom, right? If you were to say that, they would say, no, it isn't. I grew up here. This is normal. You may say, well, what about the murder? What about this? Well, that's, that's normal. That happens. What about the fornication? What about marriage being thrown out? But they say, that's normal. That's normal. It's kind of, kind of like today, doesn't it? What about the corruption in leadership? Oh, well, they always do that. And you're willing to die for this place? Yes, I am willing to die for it, they would say. Uh-oh, see, you'd be fighting propaganda. That's what you'd be fighting. You'd be fighting the fact that people, when they're born in a place, the iniquity is normal to them. Nudity, normal. Pornography on the computers is normal. Cursing is normal. Kids disrespecting their parents is normal. All those things would be normal. Corruption in high place is normal. Be normal. Hmm? Normal, normal, normal. Somebody says, so why do you cite Enoch and Estrus? Because I know something about Enoch and Estrus. That's why. I have no choice but to deny the claim of Enoch and Estrus by those 
who supposedly found it. And if the people who know the truth would ever come forward, many minds would be free, but they won't. They won't do it because it would crush people's beliefs in certain things. It would expose too much, but I'll tell you this, the book of Enoch is going to most certainly open up the eyes of many. It will. The Colburn Bible? No. Not going to do it because Christ said don't do it. The book of Enoch? They had the book of Enoch. The disciples did. But I won't go any further than that. They were totally familiar with the book of Enoch. As does, that was part of the main scriptures they used to carry and their their back things going from place to place. They didn't carry the Colburn Bible. They carried the book of Enoch. They had all five all five of those those scroll things that they used to carry around, the little satchels. There are five books in the book of Enoch. They had all five. They made references to them all throughout the thing, and it never the book of Enoch just compliments everything else that happened. But see I know that personally, right? My advice to anybody else is let the Lord lead you to things. The Lord clearly told us, though. Don't go wandering into all these other doctrines. And you know what the telltale sign of any Christian who goes into these other doctrines? They get bitter and mean and hateful. They do. Prideful. All these ways start inching back into them. It becomes fascinating enough that they can't leave it alone. And if they're not careful, they can be lost in it. Right? If the Lord guides somebody to the Colburn Bible, I can almost guarantee you that person is going to be rooted and grounded in Christ Jesus. You'll never see them all angry, upset, and bitterness or anything else. How do I know that? Because the Lord did not involve me in certain areas until the day I can no longer be upset by people. I used to be upset by people all the time. Depressed by people, sad by things that would happen in the world. Not anymore. Because I'm rooted in Christ. And they don't have an ability to change my emotions. The worst things have happened. And nobody ever knew it. You guys didn't know it. You didn't know it. You heard the same mic. You may hear my tone change. Based on spiritual things with me prior to a conversation. You cannot discern. If something is ripping me apart or not. Right? You can't discern that. Because I'm not going to be moved. I'm moved truthfully by the Lord's word. By his decrees. By his goodness. I'm not moved by trouble. Nor good times. Not moved by that. Not moved by having power, being powerless. I'm not moved by that. I am moved by the word of God. But the Lord didn't put me in any place to confirm anything when I was not. Why would he put a person who would be drawn into something ungodly? Why would God put them near it? The Lord's Prayer says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hmm. Somebody says, are the Hopi Blue and Red Kachinas the same as binary system? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. See, I heard that story in my family line a long time ago about the Hopis. Blue Red Kachina. Yeah. I heard that. I know that very well. No about Kahana. No, the whole thing. I know about the whole thing. The conditions of if he comes into the east versus the west. The Gord of Ashes. I know the whole story. I do. But what you may not know, and don't go investigate it, is this. You ready? Some people have messed up what the Hopi carried. Do you guys know that the Hopi talked about Jesus of Nazareth? Figure that one out. Yeah, that'll blow you away, won't it? It's on a disc. Four discs were made, put in four different lands. Christ Jesus was mentioned in one he was described. They were told to hear him that he would return again. He also told them to abandon. 
to abandon some things. See, this world is so messed up and corrupted that through archaeologists who prove things, you had a younger generation of Native Americans that come forward and declare the prideful ways of their ancient folks, and they threw away all the redemptive knowledge. They did. There were certain Native Americans that were devoted to Satan. I'm not going to tell you which one. But they were devoted to Satan alone and nobody else. And they marked everybody that would ever come forward in their bloodlines with satanic works. And the grounds they claimed, they had ceremonies on every single month until the day they couldn't be found anymore to declare it. A home place, like recharging of darkness. And it just so happens that place was found and is utilized by another organization. Isn't that something? There's some dark things that have happened in histories that we cannot prove. And unless you have family who is, who is, who is honest and goes back some lineages, and because you always find these divergence with Native American stories. You always find divergence. Always. Which means you'll have hints of something that changed in all these lands. You'll hear of a war, a true war of darkness and light in these lands. You hear of so many things. But you also hear of the word of the Lord, how it made it to these lands. How the gospel made it to these lands. And we're not talking, we're, we're talking thousands of years ago. Mexico knows the truth. They know the truth. They know the truth from one of Noah's sons. Do you know why they keep things secret for the sake of relationships to keep the money flow going? Because if a powerful nation says, don't share the truth, because it's not in our best interest, they will not. They'll make up lie after lie to keep the money flow going. Why? Listen, because when you're absent spiritual authority in a true relationship with Christ, you need other people. You need whatever they can provide you. If any of us truly, truly trusted Jesus, I mean truly, then we would, we would understand he can provide to us beyond the almighty dollar, right? We'd understand that. We would understand that in truth we truly need him and nothing else. But who's at that point? Who? Type of one if you're at that point. If you don't need money, because if you're at that point, then you can give away everything you have and live happily for the rest of your life and flourish and grow. See? Is anybody at that point yet? Or do we still need resources from the earth? I think we still need resources from the earth. I don't think we're there yet. I do not. I think that a time is coming, but we're not there yet. That's what I believe. I believe that we're still heavily dependent upon money. Because if we were not, we would not engage with money at all. We would not have any money at all. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't like money. I don't. But also I have a promise because the time will come. When all the works of the Lord will return with him. The works that we're not witnessing, right, collectively, we're going to see it all. Where you'll be fed and no food will have moved anywhere. Where your thirst to be quenched if there'll be no water. Where people could burn and have lots of witnesses to see them in the flames. And when they come out, they won't even so much as smell like smoke. All that's coming back. All of it's coming back. All of it. And the Lord is faithful to what he wrote. He is. 
the other part of that is sometimes things can be very true, but they're more distraction than anything else. Suppose you found out something was very true in times of old, and they could be true today, but they do not edify anything in your life. It'd be useless. It'd be like a child finally under knowing who Santa Claus is, but they have no food on the table. Their knowledge of Santa Claus is not going to help them fill their bellies. There's lots of wisdom in the earth just like that. Godly wisdom is needful, but wisdom in the earth is different. What man calls wisdom is not what the Father calls wisdom. There are lots of supernatural things happening now, but they simply would not edify your life. Suppose you're in the middle of winter, bad storms, right, everything else, and somebody gives you scuba gear. It's not going to help you too much. What if somebody gave you a fan? It's not going to help you too much. That's why God supplies according to the season. All right? And all of us can do better at trusting. And God supplying us with every season. All right? Now that brings up one more thing, and I have to get back to this. The Lord was outspoken one time in the New Testament because of one thing that was notable. It was almost like you, when you read it, you perceive him as talking louder than normal. Do you guys know when that was? I'll tell you when it was. It's when the Lord said, you can discern. You can discern if, a, I'm going to paraphrase, you can discern if a storm is coming by the color of the clouds, the sand, the other, but you cannot discern the coming of the Son of Man. He was not very pleased. Because they were not discerning the seasons of the living God upon this earth. They could discern everything of the earth, but they could not discern spiritual seasons. They could discern everything else. They knew about everything else, but they were spiritually mindless. The Lord does not want us to be that way. He does not want us to be in a position where we cannot discern the spiritual season. And we all know there's a time and a season for all things. We know that. And this is a season of closing, which is not obvious to the world. But it should be obvious to you and to me. And a real change is taking place. Not just some change we read about, but a change that will affect every soul on this planet. This will undergo. This is the final one. Hmm. Anyway, all right, let me get back to this. So hopefully um, I answered those questions to the best of my ability. I'm going to add this to, you know what, it, it really, now one thing that does bother me is when a person is taken by the many traps laid in this world. The Bible says when Satan, when he tells a lie, speaks of his own. What does that mean? That means Satan was in the past. He influenced kingdoms, kings, and many things. They set up lies back then that are being uncovered now. And because they're being uncovered now and they're Satan's lies back then, men today accept them as truth and they cannot see the lie. Do you guys see that? When Satan tells a lie, he tells of his own. Of his own what? Of his own things. Of his own actions. Of his own plans and his devices. He historically influenced these kingdoms. A long time ago, the Sumerian kingdom, the fallen kingdoms, he influenced those kingdoms. 
and people dig them up and what do they discover? Lies. Manuscripts of lies. But lies? Now, when it comes to authenticating who wrote what, God gave you internal confirmation of his truth. You did not need the Bible to know that Jesus existed. You did not need the Bible to know that God was God. You didn't even need the Bible to know that Jesus was returning. But you do need, you do need something to show you what happened in Egypt, don't you? You do need something to confirm what took place among Native Americans. You do need something to tell you what happened historically to other lands. You do not need anything to know many things of the Most High. God gave you internal confirmation. Thank God for that. Because men, the fallen, Nephilim, they try to lie. They try to write lies historically so that when people dig up something old, they think it's true. Just more lies for the bucket. Please remember that. Because just because the, the, the numbers work out does not make something true. Just because it sounds plausible does not make it true. Satan is very good at that. We should all understand how he makes the outcome look absolutely good, favorable, and plausible at the beginning, only for the ending to almost consume us and our lives. We should know that already. That Satan has planted many things to trap us, ultimately to destroy us should know that already. All right. Back to the reading. For all nations have drunk the wine of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are, are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Let me stop right here. We just read about the fallen state of Jerusalem, Right? We did. We read about the fallen state of Jerusalem. Here we're reading about Babylon. But why is it when you read Babylon, there are bits and pieces of every nation in there? Well, see, we read something last week. Do you guys remember what we read? Do you remember? The blood, the martyrs of Jesus, the blood of the prophets, was found where? On whose hands? Whose hands? The sinner's hands. You remember that? You guys remember that? Do you remember what we read last week in, in I believe it was Revelation 16? Do you guys remember that? Listen to this. Now I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which arm which was and which shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Who is he talking about? Who is he talking about? He's talking about the people of the earth that are left during the time of the wrath of God. The people that are left are sinners. The sinners, the sinners have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. The sinners did. So if the sinners, remember at the beginning of this conversation I said, the people constitute a nation. So if God is saying Babylon, He's talking about a certain type of people. There is no Babylon without the people, is there? Is there? There's no Babylon without the people, right? The people constitute a nation. And in Revelation 16, if we read, right, that those sinners of whom the wrath of God is against, the sinners have shed the blood of the prophets and of the saints. In her was found the blood of the prophets, right? It, this woman is, is clearly a sinful state of a place. And we know what that place is. So, but we're still talking about sin. And in Revelation, if you go all the way to Revelation 21 and 22, you start reading a very interesting story, right? You read a very interesting story. But most importantly, um, in Revelation, um, um, let me go find it here real quick. You read something here in Revelation. Let me, let me find it here. Hold on. So I cannot. I don't want to mess it up for you guys. Because this gives people all the time.
And it's, it, the more you read it, the more it's embedded in your mind, the more you see the truth of it, right? Because we always talk about, people always, you hear, you hear many pastors, and I believe it too, that the, this, this, um, the Ezekiel 38, right? The Ezekiel, the wars described in Ezekiel are about to take place. You also hear about Gog and Magog, correct? Gog and Magog. A lot of people say, ooh, this is Gog and Magog. Well, let me read something to you. You ready? You ready? And when the thousand years are expired, and Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Did you hear that? Right after that thousand years that Satan is bound, he is loosed again. And it says he goes out to the four quarters of the earth, comma, Gog and Magog. Why would that be in there? Why would Gog and Magog be in there? Because at this time, the entire world has become Gog and Magog. Do you see that? The whole world has become Gog and Magog. Why is it only used then? Gog and Magog went through a process. They saw something, and after seeing it, they still went against it. And so guess what? At the end of Revelation, that's precisely what the earth went through. But prior to that, you hear about another place called Babylon. Babylon. And the people of Babylon have very specific ways. They have a history. It just so happens that the earth, the earth is Babylon. The whole earth is Babylon. God does everything for a reason. Who did he exile Jerusalem to? He exiled Jerusalem to Babylon. Babylon. That's what he did. Right? To Babylon. Babylon then. It could be said that Babylon in this context is the whole world. The whole world. Why? Because of the practices of the people. Hmm? The whole world. Isn't that something? The entire world. Hmm? Hmm? Somebody, somebody in Mitchell says, "When really he he magnes his word above his name." What, what is this? This person, this uh, K. Gray. 7670? Who are you talking about over there, brother? It seems like you want to know something. You're awfully busy over there. Okay, now what about, see, there it is. Tatum says, I get confused when that war will be, but after the millennial, God may, God, of these two wars, everybody has that, right? Everybody thinks that because, listen, here, here is, here's the mind. When somebody says a name like Babylon, you think of a nation. When somebody says Gog Magog, you start thinking of a specific scripture, right? What does God do with prophecy? They open and they close. Is that correct? Far too often, a prophecy will open and continue, and then God will close that prophecy. He'll bring it to completion. When God brings a prophecy to completion, he'll always mention that prophecy again. That's the pattern throughout the entirety of the Word of God. He did that with Christ, too. He did that with the flood, too. He mentions it the first time. Right? He does. And we get to see the people that constituted the original places and things and everything else. But then afterward, we see the closure of that prophecy or the ending or the completion of that prophecy. And when it's mentioned again, it normally takes a broader spiritual form. For example, Babylon started out as a physical country, right? But even in the book of Daniel, it says something about Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar was a place. And then in that statue, all the other kingdoms were inferior to it. But King Nebuchadnezzar was a standard. And if he was the standard and all the other kingdoms were inferior, and there are only four in human existence... Then Babylon is what? 
if there are only four kingdoms in the book of Daniel for the entirety of the earth, four kingdoms, and they all come one after the other, then all those kingdoms are Babylon. Babylon, the head of gold. Babylon, the, the, the other kingdoms. Babylon, Babylon with the feet, with the iron and clay. That's still Babylon. Having dominion over what the entire earth. That's why the book of Daniel is so important. Because Babylon, the four kingdoms of this earth, of which King Nebuchadnezzar is the standard, or is that head of gold, all of them are Babylon. So this entire time, Babylon has been the entire earth. Do you see that? Do you see it? And then the everlasting kingdom comes in, crushing and subduing all the other kingdoms, smashing them in little pieces. The everlasting kingdom that will not pass away. That is God's kingdom. Right? You see that? It was Babylon that was given dominion over all the earth, wherever the birds fly, wherever the fish swim, wherever the land animals, the own people are. And King Nebuchadnezzar was the standard of the kingdom. There were only four, and they had dominion over the whole earth. So then the way of Babylon is the way we're living in right now. That's why God refers to the whole earth as Babylon. Do you see? You see? Even when we read this, we start seeing in Revelation, he's talking about Babylon falling. Now, all of us can mention and say, wait a minute, all the idols fell? Yes, all of us. Oh, the whole world has idols all over the place. God is not, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, America is Babylon, right? But look, everywhere has, has these things of Babylon in it. Every statue is going to be hewn down. Every monument is going to be hewn down. All of it. Everything. It's just like Babylon. And what governed Babylon back then? The rule of law. What governs the world right now? The rule of law. It's the same thing. Same exact thing. They fight to see who's king over Babylon, just like they did in the days of old. They do. Because you had a Persian king that was king of Babylon. And then you had some other guy, some other, you know, nation that was king of Babylon. So there we are with Babylon. But then there's fulfillment with Gog and Magog about a specific war on the people they're in. Now, in Babylon, you have different types of people, don't you? Gog Magog is about our people and their chief prince. They have specific ways about them. And God said, well, he's going to get them. Right? So at the end, in Revelation, the whole world becomes Gog Magog. The four quarters of the earth become Gog Magog. And God's fulfillment takes place then. And there you are. Hmm. See how that works? Somebody says, I don't understand why God used King Nebuchadnezzar. Because all things are God's creation. The same way he uses a skunk. Look, I, look, I, I don't follow skunks around. But they're part of God's creation. And they do serve critical purposes in the earth. But I do know. Just like poison ivy. Right? Just like poison ivy. God can utilize all of his creation in any way he sees fit. We all too often, we don't understand how he uses that. But it's his creation. That goes back to your faith. You really have to, you really have to reassert your own belief in things. You have to say, wait a minute. Do I really believe that God created all of this? Because if I do, let me take a step back and start to think in that mindset, right? Let me start thinking in that mindset. And when you do, when you start thinking in that mindset versus, you know, all this other stuff people are talking about, the Big Bang and this, that, and the other, when you start thinking in the mindset that the Lord has given us, things clear up. The moment you doubt, right, what are those milestones or key pillars in our faith that's when you start having too many questions. Too many questions. Job said to the Lord, why, why was I even created? You know what the Lord said to Job? Whew. The Lord shut him down and shut him up. 
In other words, the Lord said, don't you, don't you question me. You are my creation. You exist for my pleasure, for what I want you to do. I don't exist for what you think I should do. We forget that, don't we? We exist for his pleasure. For whatever he wants to use us for, we are here. We exist for that. And see, that's what's so, this is the prideful part of humanity. They don't want that to be true. They don't want that to be true. Why do you think they want to escape earth? They want to be more. They want to be their own gods. They don't want to be part of creation that somebody made and can utilize them as he sees fit. They don't want that. They don't want that. You hear people say it all the time. They're not going to rule over me. They're not going to tell me what to do. This is rebellion is within people so bad. They can't submit to anything. They can't submit to anything. But the Lord made us. Right? And when you truly do come to terms, and when you truly believe that, that's the same day you take no thought of your own life. You don't. Because then at that point you understand that God has been guiding you this entire time. And he is a father of love because he could have guided you right off the cliff. And had you live in a destitute position, broke up and smashed in between the rocks for years, but he didn't. He guides us with a very gentle hand of love. He does. He does not have to. He can change anything he, so, he sees fit. God doesn't try to do anything he either does or he does not. He does not try. That's man's language and foolishness when people think that. It is. So, if we can remember that, my, my. Right? My, my. Forever in crisis, but he didn't. You're still here. Thank God for that. No, he didn't. He didn't have us all smashed up in rocks. He's full of love. Isn't he? God is full of love. He really is. He's got to be full of love to tolerate somebody like me. Are you kidding? You, you, ever, you guys ever met a, just a terrible child? I mean a terrible child. I'm not talking about a kid that won't do what you tell him to do, but a kid that's vindictive and... Everything else, and they're smart, and they try every nerve you ever thought you had. I can imagine us being that way to the most time. Right? Except, except his love he commanded towards us. Right? His love he commanded towards us cannot be turned back. He can do nothing but love us. And that, and that, I think that's amazing. God commanded his love towards us. So guess what? His love will never be turned away. No wonder... No wonder the disciples said, I'm convinced. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. I am too, because I understand what I've done in life. And the Lord has been nothing but gracious. In the worst times I've been in, he's been gracious. Very gracious. <laughs> so he said, talking about me as a kid. <laughs> But that's us. That's how we are. My goodness, I think I've talked away the time. It's okay. It's okay. Because we're going to make all this up. Guys, listen, your questions are invaluable. You guys know that. Here, here's why. And we're not done with these questions. Certainly in a topic like this, here's why. If you have a question, you know that you know 5,000 other people out there somewhere have a question too. We have a pretty big audience tonight listening. And so I know that you guys, if you have a question, it's on somebody else's mind. And if those questions can get answered according to the word of God, that will do somebody else so much help. Don't ever think I get offended by your questions, right? I just, if I miss half your question, you have to restate the whole thing again, right? I don't catch them all, all the time. I don't. So you have to restate them. But don't ever think that somehow I'm going to take your question and get offended or mad at you by it. No, I, I get passionate sometimes with the answers, yes. But that has nothing to do with you, the individual. Okay? Nothing to do with you guys, the individual. All right, don't misunderstand that. All right? Folks, God bless each and every one of you guys. Listen, I'm going to be back next time. We're going to continue with this topic. Okay? We're going to continue with this topic with the questions. 
because I know there are lots of questions and lots of little things that uh, we have not worked out yet, right? And so, hey, I'll do my best to get those answered because if you have a question, we need to work something out, then let's get everybody on the, let's get everybody in here to get that worked out for everybody. How about that? I'm not the one appointed to work out everything. No, no that, that's all of us. It takes all of our input, all of us. Remember, this is the council of time, right? Not the Michael of time, this council of time. Remember that. That takes all of us so that everybody can benefit. Folks, God bless you. I'm going to see you guys tomorrow, Lord willing. I won't do this again. God bless and keep all of you. I'll see you guys next time right here at COT.